Hey, everybody, Dr. Rob Silverman here. I'm here with my good friend, trainer, health advocate, par excellence, Christopher Guerrero. He is the CEO of Westchester Fit. I think you've been there for about 15 years now. Uh, we're, we just surpassed 14 years, but training wise, uh, about yes, 16, 17 years. Cause I was doing it, uh, a little bit beforehand in a right. garage. Yeah. In a garage. Well, I mean, that's when you were just a CrossFitter, if you will, before Correct. you've evolved to where you are as a health and fitness, in my opinion, clearly an expert, certainly in the area. And I know that nationally you're lecturing and I know you have some, aspirations to lecture internationally but we've got an interesting background chris actually came in for a back injury yeah and he he kind of like was a whirlwind he was like look i want i need you to fix my back i want to exercise i want to be able to compete and i want to be able to change people's health trajectory and i was just there and i was like all right this guy's my guy he's my avatar before there was such a thing as avatar so why don't you take us uh through your evolution sure uh, man. So from the beginning, health and fitness, um, it was really, really early on, you know, I want to say like nine or 10, I've, I've always been like a physical, very physical. I, 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 I played basketball, and martial arts growing up and I, and I always enjoyed the, the portion that most people avoided. I like doing the push-ups and the sit-ups and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and there's a really weird thing from my childhood that I could remember my mom, so this had to have been, man, almost 30 years ago, had an in-home personal trainer, wow. which, was, which was back then, that's very, very rare. Uh, now, looking back, she might not have been the best personal trainer, but I remember I would sit and I would watch them work together. And I didn't realize that at 10, that would have such an impact on my life. So um, I remember in middle school, uh, they had like this big record board in my middle school and it was like most sit-ups in a minute, pull-ups, all these things. And I wanted to do, I wanted to break the sit-up record. So I trained and trained and trained and uh, eventually in eighth grade, I ended up breaking the record. Uh, it was 89 sit-ups in a minute and they didn't believe me. The, the coach didn't believe me, the gym teacher. <laughs> so he made me do it a second time in front mm -hmm. of it. And I ended up doing that, but that, that, that was like the start into health and fitness. And then, uh, you know, went to school at the university of Michigan, uh, studied, uh, movement science and in kinesiology, uh, actually went into finance for a little while, uh, worked at JP Morgan. And while I was there, I just felt that something wasn't right. Like I, you know, at 24, 25 years old, I, I, I didn't feel fulfilled. And at the time I had stumbled upon CrossFit and I was just, you know, looking for out of the box training at the time, functional training wasn't even a buzzword. It was just like, what is this that they're doing that they're training their full body? Um, it was actually the movie 300 that I saw. Like, how are all these guys, how do all these guys look like that? I tried the 300 workout and I started going down all these rabbit holes, found CrossFit. Um, and I found a lot of my time at work. I was reading articles and studying like, hey, how can I possibly do this as a career? Got an NASM uh, certification, and then I, I started training people in my parents' garage, like some of my mom's friends, you know, charging, hey, 40 bucks for personal training, whatever. I then decided, I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm going to just get this CrossFit affiliation. Um, I'd saved a bunch of money living at home. I bought like $30,000 worth of equipment. And at the time, like Rogue Fitness is a big thing now. That didn't exist when I opened. It, it was something called like garage, gyms. I, I don't even remember. But like the customer service, they take two weeks to get back to you. I outfitted my parents' garage. And after or before work, I would train people. Um, I started getting random hits from the CrossFit affiliate map. And I was training random people. And I remember my stepfather told me one morning, I had a doctor, Dr. Randy, uh, who now is like one of the board certified like top doctors in Chicago runs one of the biggest hospitals in Chicago he was one of my first clients and I had this guy running up my driveway at like 6 30 in the morning in snow so uh fast forward a couple months um I end up quitting my job I opened a space in White Plains in a little office building never thought I'd stay there and honestly uh, I was super nervous to to 
to leave my career, which was very lucrative at the time, and uh, do this, but I felt it was the right thing to do. And that was March of 2010. And we're now January 2024. Um, I'm the sole owner operator of Westchester Fit and White Plains. Um, I, I also co own Stateline Fitness in Greenwich. And I've owned two other facilities in the Westchester area, which I have uh, then since sold and, you know, still friends with the partners in, in those locations. But that's pretty much where I'm at now um, from a fitness standpoint. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting to hear your epiphany because um, you made very clear that the finance world, though, it is lucrative and it's fine for someone else. You uh, you had a little different mission and um, you had conveyed the interest in it that you wanted to help people get healthy because you wanted to do exercise, you wanted to do nutrition. I mean, you literally had this whole list of things that you wanted to do. And I'm so compelled by you had such an interesting short and a long-term plan because as we know, exercise is just one step forward, but a poor diet is two steps back. So you can never compete with what you eat. Um, that said, one of the biggest problems in America today is what we eat. In 1970, one in 50 people had diabetes. Today, one in nine have diabetes. So obviously this influx of sugar consumption, ultra processed foods has been a problem. So if I come in today to your gym or I work with you one-on-one, -on -one, what are you gonna program for me to put in my diet? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, well, the, the first thing would be, uh, when you come into the gym, we like to sit down and do what we call a no sweat intro, right? The no sweat intro is basically like a 30 minute appointment where we sit down and get to know you. A lot of gyms like to do these free trial classes, but there's no way for me to know anything about this person without that. So give a quick tour of the gym. We sit down and I ask a bunch of questions. Um, first one being, why are you here? What can I help you with? Uh, then as we start to peel the layers of the onion back and kind of get to know the person a little bit better and what makes them tick and like what their diet is. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this multiple times when I ask, Hey, so do me a favor, take me through a typical day of eating. And one of the first things they'll use will be like, Oh, well, I eat pretty good. I say that too and much. I'm like, okay, well, I want to know what eating pretty good to you mean. So why don't you, you know, like, and then I'll give them a, an example of what I do. Right. Really, uh, nutrition is so nuanced, as you know. So, for example, like seafood, right, could be a healthy uh, a protein source for some people. But if someone has an allergy to, to, to seafood, then that particular protein product is not going to be good for, for the individual. Um, I am very much into just trying to improve habits. I find that when people, specifically like this time of year in January, try to overhaul everything in their life at once, it just sets them up for failure. And I've seen this over and over and over again over the last 15 years where January 1 comes around, they're going to go to the gym seven days a week and strength train. They're going to do 10,000 steps. They're going to get eight hours of sleep. They're going to they're gonna cold plunge every morning. They're going to eat keto. Um, and you know, 11 or 12 days in, they fail because that's not a sustainable approach. So um, it would really depend on your goal. Circling back to your question, uh, like what is it, what is it that you're interested in accomplishing? And then kind of starting, starting with a baseline of education, just explaining like, Hey, do you understand what macronutrients are? Do you know what protein is? Do you know what carbs are? Do you know what fats are? And trying to give a basic framework of what a healthier approach to eating would be because there's so many people that lack the education to even understand how to make like a well-balanced and healthy meal. Yeah. I'd like to piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, you know, I believe that, that you can exercise an hour a day and I know you know this and have said this multiple times, but you uh, need to eat the other 23 hours in a day. And um, most people just don't know it's unfortunate so I like to use acronyms for everybody. So my acronym of 2024 is don't eat crap. So C is carbohydrates or more like refined carbohydrates. The R is refined sugars. The A is additives and the P is preservatives. So if we go back to uh, clean whole foods in a 
chrononutrition time frame, which we'll get into intermittent fasting or timed eating, um, I think that people really will find that can be the backbone of what they need to go forward and get their health. So I kind of, hopefully, I know you like to play golf. I hope I teed it up for you to get to the timed eating. I know you're big on timed eating or intermittent fasting or whatever Vogue term they want to use right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I actually started, uh, man, I guess it would be considered the appropriate term would be time restricted feeding, but I, most people refer to it as intermittent fasting where I loosely follow a 16, eight protocol, um, which means I, I, I abstain from calories for 16 hours. And then my eating window is eight hours. I'm not as maniacal now as I was four years ago about it. You know, sometimes it's 14, 15 hours. Sometimes I might fast for 24 hours. I, I, honestly, I, I really try to intuitively eat when I'm hungry and, and eat the things that make me feel good. Uh, but that word intuitive is such a catch word because people think they could do intuitive eating without really even understanding what they should be eating. Um, I guess the premise behind it or, or, or what I would say, the reason why I was interested in it when I was competing as an athlete, I always found myself not really hungry, but knowing that I had to eat to support and fuel the amount of exercise I was doing, I thought that I had to eat breakfast in the morning. But what happened for me was I'd have to eat before a heavy training session and I just never felt good because, you know, my body was still digesting food while I really needed the blood flow, like to support my muscles and everything else I was doing. What, 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 why, why I love fasting and it's not necessarily, it's definitely not a cure all. It's definitely not like the best thing for everybody, but, but why I find it really helps people is it eliminates food decision, right? So like you usually skip breakfast or dinner. So let's say you're taking one of those decisions out every day. That, that, that makes someone go from 21 meal decisions per week to 14. Because of the condensed eating win window, generally, the idea would be that these people are eating less calories, which then that calorie balance equation would put them in, in, in a point where they should be losing weight. Where people get into trouble is that they do not consume sufficient amount of protein during that time, and then they start to waste and cannibalize muscle, which I think in 2022 and 2023, it's like, that's like the longevity organ that having adequate muscle is the most important thing. Um, and I love seeing that because three or four years ago, I was still getting people like, I don't want to get bulky. I don't want to lift weights. Now, a lot of the inquiries are, I need to lift weights. Um, so I, I like that the research is trending in that direction and showing how important that is. Uh, but for me, fasting works. It works for my lifestyle. Um, and I know for others, it doesn't. So, You know, it's funny. You, you kind of set me up. You just reteed it for me because the intermittent fasting has a plethora of health-promoting properties, good for the gut, good for the brain, um, excellent for blood sugar, body composition, and the like. But the term now in 2024, which really – speaks to what you said before is intermittent energy restriction. And it does have this positive effect on what I call the superhighway to health, which is the gut to brain axis. They did a study and it just came out uh, last month on 25 obese individuals. And they talked about their weight loss after two months on intermittent energy restriction. And they lost up to 17 pounds, 8% of body weight, the bulk of which believe it or not was fat, which is unheard of. They used a functional MRI to determine activity uh, parts of their brain regions, which all went up. So cognition increased. And they used fecal uh, samples to identify different abundant gut microbes. Their ecosystem changed around. They had a reduction in E. coli. So the takeaway or the result was there was a dynamic alteration of the brain gut microbiome axis, and they had weight loss under intermittent energy restriction. And you said it best, you took it from 21 to 14 meals. Now, this intermittent energy restriction protocol was vastly different than something that you or I would recommend. It was 55% carbs, 30% fat, and 15% protein. 
over that 32 day period, they broke it up in stages of each in eight days. So stage one was two thirds of the calories. Stage two was half the calories. So they really dropped a precipitous amount. Stage three was a third and stage four was a fourth. But the idea of eating in a timing, allowing your body to rest and eating less calories and better calories, that seemed to be the uh, illuminating fact of the whole study. So you put that in together, what other things do you do and what other recommendations do you make for health? Because, you know, again, you originally were CrossFit, which is great. I personally am a big uh, proponent of CrossFit. I think it's brought so much to athletics and exercise, but you've really, again, I mean, meeting you at 26 and seeing you now, not that you weren't fabulous at 26, it's just like, um, I'm just happy I got to met you and I just watch your trajectory and your knowledge and your learning and all that you've done. You know, where would you take somebody now, not just with the intermittent fasting, but more on dietary protocols and uh, with your exercise prescription? Yeah, so that, I mean, that, that's such a great question. And this is stuff that I love talking about. So I think the difference then was competing in a sport. And what most people don't understand is that competing in a sport, any sport, so CrossFit was my sport, but whether you're basketball, football, and you're at a very high level, that's not necessarily like good for your body or good long-term for your health. You know, there's so many there injury breakdown, hormone disruption, all that kind of stuff. So I think the change for me was as I started to get older, like how do I want to live uh, later in life, right? Like I don't want to be an 80 year old that can't stand up or functionally move around. So the general prescription that I give people now is, Hey, I want you to lift weights two to three times a week, right? Group classes at my gym are phenomenal and still our staple offering, but the absolute best approach would be either working with a trainer one-on-one -on -one, where the program is specifically custom to you. Um, or even in like a small semi-private type setting where it's just two or three people, right? So strength training, number one. Number two, because I was recently reading a book where it said that a lot of people think they might work out five to six days a week. And I know a lot of people like this and they think, all right, I checked the workout box off. But then they go sit at a desk for eight hours. They don't move. They go, they drive in their car. They sit in there for another hour and then they go sit at home, eat dinner, watch Netflix, and they probably get like 2000 steps in a day. So the second biggest thing is just basic general overall movement. So from a, from a baseline standpoint, like if I have like an, an active person that works out in my gym and they're stuck in terms of weight, I'll say, Hey, why don't we track your steps for a week and let's see where you're at. And a lot of them are shocked to see how immobile they are after they work out. So I might suggest something like, Hey, get a minimum of 7,500 to 8,000 steps per day, right? With the upper limit, if you could push to 10,000 or 12,000, fantastic. That will require more time. And if you're somebody at 2000, you could start by, Hey, let's add 500 this week do 2,500 every day and then go to 3000 and so forth. So that kind of checks off the boxes for movement walk and strength train three times per week. Um, if you could do a little more, and this is being realistic with somebody's lifestyle, that this is not going to completely take over their life. So, so, so th th that, that takes care of like the movement component in terms of like recovery. I mean, the biggest thing you could do is make sure that you're getting seven, at least seven hours of quality sleep every night, you know, um, making sure that, that you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for an environment that that's cool. You're, you're not scrolling through social media at night. Like if you're going to, if you're going to do any kind of screen, I would say it would be a TV. It's not as engaging as social media. Uh, if you're going to do that, you can wear blue blockers at night, but you know, try, really try to get at least seven hours of sleep every night from a nutrition standpoint. Um, to me, the most important things, uh, like we can get into all the nuances, right? Like don't eat processed foods and all that. That is all really important. But if I'm looking at someone, it's try not to eat too much. Eat three meals a day. Try to avoid snacking. Make sure you're drinking water in between. And I like the water test. If you're hungry, right? Or if you think you're hungry and you can't eat like a pure piece of protein, like you're not hungry enough to eat like a chicken breast, a piece of steak, a piece of fish, 
drink a glass of water and wait five to 10 minutes. If you're still hungry, fine, then, then it's time to eat something. But if you're not, you're probably just bored or something else going on. So the hydration and nutrition stuff, I really focus on, hey, try to get some good high quality protein, uh, keep your calories in check. And not that carbs and fats don't matter, but as you know, some people do better with higher carbs. Some people do better with higher fat. It really is dependent on the person. And I try not to confuse people with that. Um, and this is one thing that I would have to mention. So like, I love the sauna and cold plunge and all these things are great. People are stepping over like the opportunity to do things that don't cost money, like getting your nutrition and sleep and basic movement in check. If you don't have all those ABCs checked off and you think somehow that the sauna or the cold plunge is going to miracul miraculously change your life, um, you're missing out. Just stick to the basics. And then if you have all the basics covered and you want to go a couple steps further, by all means. I mean, I love the sauna. I have a sauna in my house. I use it two to three times a week. Um, but that is in no way, shape or form a replacement for making sure that I get my seven hours I'm eating really clean 85 to 90% of the time, you know, lots of lean proteins, fruits, vegetables, some carbs like uh, sweet potato or white rice. And, and I'm lifting three times a week and doing martial arts and, and, you know, doing stuff that makes you like genuinely happy. Like that mental health component of it is another thing that I, that I talk about. And I think that's why people love our gym is that we're, we're big advocates of that and having like a communal based fitness where people are friends and we do, social things i think they said after covid like there's been like an uh i don't know if it would be, is it an endemic or an epidemic of like loneliness mm. people just feel lonely and alone and uh unhappy and that and that that's that's really sad you know that's a that's a that's a sad state to be in um and I think th those those are the components of like what I would what I would venture to say. There's the the, the physical health, the nutrition, the recovery, and then that mental side of just try to do something that makes you happy every day. Wow, there's a lot to unbox there. So I'm gonna hit the since muscle mass is a longevity organ, I like to consider it the currency of longevity. Um, let's talk about some basic resist resistive skills that people could use every day. So I'm going to give you a move, you know, move. For instance, I'm going to say push. What would be one of the better push moves that both men and women could do, or one for a man and one for a woman? And uh, there's a few. Honestly, push-ups. It doesn't require equipment. There's infinite ways to scale it. A regular push-up, push-up from your knees. If you need to modify, I I prefer from the knee rather than from the knees with your hands ele on an elevated surface because it gets you to go through full range of motion. And I find that people progress quicker, but you know, like a, a push up, a military press, a bench press. Um, I, I, now that I've gotten older, I like dumbbells better than barbells, but any of those three kinds of uh, pushing movements are, are really sufficient for, for building that kind of strength. Well, you just brought up something that I can't let go. So we have dumbbells, we have barbells, we have kettlebells, you have like a TRX. Right. And of course, there's body weight. Give me a feeling on any one and then all of the five I just mentioned. I love them all. I mean, it just depends on people's budget, what they're into. I go through phases, right? I go through phases where I like to hit the barbell. I go through phases where I like to hit the dumbbells or kettlebells. I, I, I do believe as we get older, um, and you could speak more on this, Bone density as we get older usually goes down a little bit. Yeah. So it makes us a little more susceptible to injuries. So I do prefer the dumbbell or kettlebell simply because even if you're training bilaterally, meaning pressing two dumbbells or kettlebells at the same time, these movements are going to show imbalances. So if one side is weaker than the other on a barbell movement. The naked eye is not going to show. You'll be able to overcompensate by twisting your shoulders or something. Whereas with dumbbells, I, I would say 99% of the movements that I, I don't train a ton of people anymore. I have a few clients that I still work with. Most of them are in their 50s or up. 99% of the work we do is with dumbbells or kettlebells. And the reason is because the movements not only show the problem, they also help to fix the problem. Whereas a barbell, I find... 
it, it's difficult to fix a, a, a problem that's on one side when you're trying to train both sides at once, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to get back to some of the basic resistive skills because I get asked this all the time. It may be inherent in name squat. What what squat exercises would you recommend? The, the basic body weight air squat is a good one. Um, you could call it like a sit to stand. Like if you have a really, really basic beginner, right? Like that's never worked out before. Um, sit down to a chair or a couch and stand up and do that a couple times a day and keep adding a uh, goblet squat with a kettlebell. I love, um, you could do squats with a dumbbell. You could do squats, so many different variations of squats with, uh, barbells, a back squat, front squat. I know you love the overhead squat for functional, like movement but it, it it's it's a movement that's so difficult for 90 plus percent of the population that i generally don't mention it and then of course I, would you uh consider the squat pattern to include things like lunges and step ups absolutely and you know it's funny you brought up the overhead squat you're right i love it because if somebody can do it it's great i'm satisfied in my chiropractic genre if they can just sit in a chair and stand up appropriately by hip hinging, which I want you to give you a little uh, input on a hip hinge and, and really explain the difference between a hip hinge and lumbar flexion when someone does exercise. And I agree with you. You said that barbells break, show the dysfunction and also the strength. Every movement, every exercise is a functional test. Yeah. T tell me a little bit about a hip, a hip hinge so everybody knows what it is and how you want people to hip hinge in lower body exercises versus lumbar flexion. So, yeah. so a uh, hip hinge uh, for the average person doesn't understand what that means. It's just like bending at your waist. So if I'm like, this is my torso and it's just like bending. Um, we think of a couple of different kinds of movements. So you think of like a basic deadlift. So again, now as people get older, like I like the barbell deadlift, but as I've gotten older and my form and mechanics are perfect, I could still feel a little bit of strain on my lower back. So something that, you know, you might substitute is like a trap bar deadlift. It takes less axial loading on the spine. It puts you into a better position. Um, dumbbell deadlifts, single leg deadlifts, uh, kettlebell deadlifts, where the kettlebell is in between the legs. So it's more of a sumo deadlift. Um, also kettlebell swings are a phenomenal exercise, one of my favorites, because um, they don't just develop that hinging power. It's a lot of speed and explosiveness, which people lose those uh, type two muscle fibers as we get older. Um, but yeah, those are those are like basic hinging patterns that I might program into um, into into uh, into an exercise regimen. I tend to stick to the same 10 to 15 movements for all of my clients, just different variations, weights, whether I'm doing tempo cluster sets or whatever. Um, keeping in mind that everybody needs to be strong to what degree is dependent on their goals. But, you know, one of the things that Greg Glassman, the founder of CrossFit said, which I found, which I found at the time it was silly, but it's so true. The, the needs of an Olympic athlete and our grandparents differ by degree, not by kind. We all need to be able to, to do the same things, get up off of the floor, you know, pull ourselves up, press ourselves, lift something and put it overhead. But my grandmother might just need to put like, uh, you know, like a, like a bowl overhead, whereas an Olympic athlete might be snatching and catching something overhead. So it's just the, it's just by nature of like what the needs of that individual person uh, is or are. You know, speaking to what you just said about that and incorporating the basic resistive skills, uh, you, you talked a lot about deadlifts. What about farmer's walks and carrying weight? So I'm a little older now. I do do some light deadlifts. I've got some structural faults. Um, Peter Tia, and we all, we both read his book. We talk about him. He's definitely the staple in longevity and, you know, uh, exercise within longevity. He talks about farmer's carriers or farmer's walks. Uh, what's your feeling on that for strength and stability? I love Dr. Tia, but I've been doing uh, carries for far longer than he's been talking about them. <laughs> I've included them as staples for the last eight or nine years. Um, 
what one of one of the uh so when you think of basic movement patterns like you've asked me push pull squat hinge core and then the other one is carry a lot of people do not add carries into their workouts so carrying stuff that is what humans evolve to do to be able to carry things long distances and you, you you heard it here first that in 2024, one of the biggest fitness trends that I see happening is going to be rucking or essentially walking with a weighted pack or a weighted vest. And that's a form of carrying because you're carrying extra load on your body. Uh, really good for cardiovascular, le less wear and tear in the joints than something like running. But it's almost like you're getting strength training and cardio all at once in this zone two range that Peter Atia talks about. But back to the initial question. Farmer's walks, phenomenal because they test our grip strength. And his research has indicated that one of the biggest determinants of overall longevity is your grip strength. Somebody falls down and they can't pull themselves back up. That's a big issue. I also like to do things like hanging from a bar. Um, but one of my all-time favorite things to do is a sandbag carry. Uh, so good for the spinal erectors, the glutes, the low back. And it just, it's just such a fantastic, like, uh, functional, like, farm strength exercise. Like, people have heard the term when they refer to people as like, oh, he has farm strength or she has farm strength. It's because of that functional work, pushing the plow, pulling the sled, carrying dumbbells or kettlebells or, or just carrying a sandbag. I am a, I'm a huge proponent of carries, and I think they are one of the most underutilized um, modalities of training that a lot of trainers are not doing with their clients that just I had I had farmers walk or sandbag carries in almost all of my sessions with clients I just think they're they're super functional so I really like what you said about rocking um I'm also seeing a lot of people in videos and maybe you can speak to this about taking a, a weight or like a bag I'm not sure what you call it and throwing it over your shoulder is it like a sandbag? That sandbag, like extensions, like yeah, um, yeah. I mean, those are so. So that's essentially like doing like an Olympic lift, like a clean, but with a sandbag. Um, and the reason those are great is, you know, as you know, you've been to my gym before. Like the the, the Olympic lifts, like snatching is probably the hardest movement to do because it requires so much mobility, right? A clean is a lot more accessible to more people, but there are so many technical components to get someone physically competent enough to be able to do it with enough weight that there's going to be a, a stimulus. Whereas with the sandbag, really what we're doing is we're teaching forceful hip extension, right? So you're teaching someone how to extend their hips fully, um, with a lot less of a technical component because you're pulling the sandbag and bringing it over your head as opposed to moving your body around a bar. Uh, it's a, it's another great exercise and something that about, I want to say five or six years ago, uh, CrossFit at the CrossFit Games really started to do this a lot with athletes. It, it's a great exercise. It's, it's just another way to teach forceful hip extension. So it'd be like in that hinging category again, but it, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great one. Oh, all right. So we, we covered what we think 2024 is going to bring as far as fitness exercise. Another question I get asked a lot, and I'm sure you do too, is since we're so concerned about sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass, and we know that protein consumption is a critical element of trying to avoid sarcopenia, you know, in conjunction with weight resistance, animal plant protein, where do you stand on that? I mean, look, I'm a... I'm a big proponent of people doing whatever they feel works for them. If any research that I have shown at adequate protein consumption, meaning your ability to di digest the amount of protein that you're taking in, I don't know that there's a difference. What I have seen is the bioavailability, meaning what you can actually absorb from the uh, nutrients is much easier from animal protein than it is from plant-based sources. That is not me saying that you can't get sufficient protein from plant-based sources, but some of the things like beans and lentils, they have like a, you know, like fibrous uh, coatings that don't make it as easily digestible for people. Um, 
but whatever works for the individual, so long as they are able to hit protein minimum requirements that are making muscle sparing, I'm all for. I just find a lot of times with, with, with people that I've worked with that are plant-based, they have a lot of gastrointestinal distress from all the fibrous matter that they're consuming. But I, I, it's, it's whatever, whatever they're able to consume comfortably and, uh, and, and hit their daily protein requirement. I, I concur with you. Um, animal versus plant protein for sarcopenia 2021 study really spoke about animal protein intake, reducing the risk of functional impairment and strength loss in older adults. Unfortunately, I fall in that category. Um, actually, higher animal protein intake led to 34 and 48% greater preservation of what you spoke about before, grip strength in men and in women. Unfortunately, there was no benefit to grip strength from plant protein. And the backbone of that may be that animal protein is greater than plant protein and allowing for muscle protein synthesis. So the takeaway is animal versus plant, clearly animal. Plant protein has its place, but the bottom line, the resounding notion is eat some quality protein. Yeah, so one of my one of my favorite, uh, I wouldn't even call him a fitness influencer, but Stan Efferding, he always talks about, because you just said eat animal protein, eat steaks, not shakes, right? So it's like, I'd much rather somebody consume actual food than supplement all the time. I, I do use supplements, but I don't want somebody getting 60 to 70% of what their daily protein need from like a protein bar or a protein shake. I much prefer actual food. Well, you just teed up my next question. You're clairvoyant without question. What supplements do you recommend generically for many of your clients and yourself? So one of the things I take myself, um, I think, you know, pre-COVID, I was not, I, I think everyone became much more, and you could definitely speak on this, much more concerned with their like immune system health, like overall health, right? So the supplements I take on a regular basis, um, I take magnesium. Um, I take a lot of, I take vitamin D regularly. Uh, you know, I think the, the, my blood levels pre COVID were like 32. And I think for athletes, it should be like 60 to 80. Now I'm in the 70 range. Uh, so vitamin D magnesium, uh, a good quality probiotic. Um, I use, uh, I use Thorn supplements a lot. I like their products. Um, I, I, I take their men's multivitamin as well. Um, I take NAC. And then recently, uh, recently, as in the last couple of months, I, I, I started taking some creatine. Um, and occasionally I'll drink a protein shake. I, I don't drink a, drink protein shakes as much as I used to. I actually prefer to get real food in, like I had just mentioned, but you know, if I'm not going to eat for two hours after working out, like I, I will have a protein shake, but the main ones are those like immune support ones, you know, the, the vitamin D magnesium, um, probiotic. I know you're a big proponent of fish oil and I think fish oil will, will, will serve a lot of people really well, including myself. I just find for whatever reason, for me, whatever one I take always upsets my stomach to a degree. But that is another one that I think a lot of people need because it does, and you could speak more on this, reducing like systemic inflammation in the body. Yeah, omega-3s, I, th I found that they have a great effect on athletes based on a lot of current state of the knowledge. So it enables athletes to have a training adaptation, improve cycling and running economy, enhancing resistance training and induced adaptogens great for brain function, has neuroprotective effects, improved cognitive functions, improved mood, reduction in fatigue, and also en enables people to have a recovery support. So when you look, if you will, of a flow chart for what omega-3s do in food or supplements, they increase your EPA and DHA exposure, which leads to increased EPA DHA status, which has a biological mechanism which leads to a physiological outcome, which is ultimately a health impact. Now, I'm gonna take another bite at the apple at, at all the supplements that you talked about. That was a great litany in that magnesium. So for everybody listening, magnesium 
Uh, L-glycinate or L-lysine is a great choice for regular magnesium. That's probably what you're taking. Magnesium citrate over 800 milligrams. If people take that, that's more, um, that's a laxative. And magnesium l 3 is used essentially for cognition and synaptic density. Vitamin D3. And I remember when you came in, your, your numbers were really good. It's D3 about 5,000. Got to mix it with K2. Yep. Pre and probiotics, you know, you want that wide range. Uh, the multivitamin, I use the same multivitamin as you. They're methylated multivitamins, meaning most of us have a methylation problem. Either we're over or under methylating. And if the vitamin is methylated, we're able to absorb it. Um, you listed NAC, which is great for upper respiratory issues, which everybody's having a lot of. We're filming this at the beginning of January. And creatine. You know, full disclosure, actually, almost like a spoiler alert. I wrote my thesis 25 years ago on creatine uh, to get out of chiropractic school. So creatine is a great uh, supplement if you want to put on some muscle mass. The only side effect is you'll put on some muscle mass. Creatine is now found to be effective with long COVID and is also great for short and long-term amnesia. So creatine is great for a teenager. There's no study to substantiate all the naysayers. And remember, avoid and ignore the naysayers in that creatine does not increase incidence of injury and musculoskeletal structural movement. It is a myth. So anything else you would want to add or what's the new hot thing that you hear everybody talking about? Uh, supplement wise? Yeah, we'll go supplement. Um, well, once you get into like your forties, everyone's talking about TRT. Um, but also, I don't know much about them, but there's a lot of talk about certain peptides like BP-157 and, and and other certain ones. I don't know much about them because I, again, like I try to be as much of a minimalist with my approach as I can and just stick to the basics. Um, Though I just try to stick to the basic supplements. I think the one that I could probably, if I could find a good one that doesn't bother my stomach would be the fish oil to add. But aside from that, you know, people take amino acids during workouts and essential amino acids. Uh, adaptogens are a big thing. Uh, these cordyceps are like lion's mane and people are taking like all these droplets of stuff. But again, I see the people taking this and I look at their lifestyle. And I'm like, why, why don't you just fix all these other things before you start supplementing? It's in I, the word supplement. It's supplemental to a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Agreed. It's supplemental to a healthy lifestyle. That's a beautiful takeaway. Um, the BPC 157 is big. We've discussed this um, on the, the podcast before the one of note that I wanted to throw out there and you'll find it of some interest for yourself is your lithin A. Urolithin A now, it comes from pomegranate, strawberries. It allows for mitophagy, the breakdown of mitochondria like autophagy. It has great mitochondrial functions. It also promotes anti-inflammatory activity, antioxidant properties, and believe it or not, it prevents cell death or early cell death. So the new kid on the block, the conversation piece without question is urolithin A. Now, we've talked about exercise. We've talked about supplements. We've talked about food. Tell us a little bit about, if I come to Chris Guerrero, what he's going to put together for me, not just me as Rob Silverman, but me as a client, me as a middle-aged guy who needs to stay healthy and you know wants to try and get like a half a six-pack. Yeah. So again, we, we, we start with that no sweat intro and, 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 and in my particular gym clients go one of three routes. And the way I look at it is in a good, better, best scenario. Okay. And that's how I'll present it to them. What's a really good scenario. Okay. Come on into the gym, join the group classes. Um, you're going to get a lot of the mental positive benefits, the endorphins, you're going to get weight training, good variety, good coaching, great coaching. And um, generally, I find that people, when they work out or move more, they, they, they are more inclined to want to eat better as well. So that would be a good scenario, right? Better scenario rather than group is some form of a hybrid membership where the person is doing group, but 
they'll do continual one-on-one -on -one training, maybe once a week, once every other week, or they'll do our nutrition habits coaching program where they're working with a, with an accountability coach who keeps them on track. We use the InBody 570. Um, there's a, a plethora of free resources and diets on the internet that the lack of information is not the problem. The problem is people sticking to the plan and that's why they need a coach, right? So I offer a coaching service. Um, so good, better, best is you stick to completely one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm going to ask you, hey, Rob, like how serious are you about your goals? How committed are you on a scale of one to 10? And if you say you're a six, why did you give me that answer? Like, why are you not an eight, a nine, or a 10? If you give me a 10 and I say, listen, the best thing for you to do right now is as follows. You're going to train with me one-on-one. -on -one three times per week, we're going to do resistance training. We'll talk about other things during our sessions that you should be doing. We'll, we'll give you a minimum step count to hit every day. We'll, we'll talk about how to make your sleep, that kind of stuff better. Make sure you're drinking enough water. Uh, one of the supplements that I didn't mention was electrolytes, right? So like give people electrolytes, things like that. And then the other component is uh, you, we also need to focus on your nutrition. Because you're never going to out-exercise a bad diet. When I go through the talk of how the body burns calories, and I explain to people that like 65 to 70 percent is predetermined based on your basal metabolic rate, or like what what the lay person would refer to as that person has a fast metabolism. No, the bigger you are, the more muscle you have, the more calories you're going to burn at rest. So it's actually a cheat code. You build more muscle, you actually get to eat more and you burn more calories at rest. But Exercise only makes up five to 10% of the total daily caloric equation. And the problem is, and I love my fitness trackers. I have a Garmin, a Whoop. These things are so wildly inaccurate in predicting how many calories you burn that people look at it like, oh, I burned 800 calories for my workout. Like I have a 115 pound female who does like a, like a, a boot camp class. I'm like, there's, there's no shot you burn that many calories in an hour. And then, and then their whole thing is thrown off in terms of how much they're eating. So we would take that best approach in a one-on-one -on -one setting where everything is directly customized for you. The pros are that everything is for you. The cons that most people see is that you are paying more for that individualized attention. But as a health and fitness professional, I have to give people, hey, this is going to be good. This is going to get you into a better spot that you are. This is better. And this is the best option. And then I allow people to kind of, you know, pick and choose what they decide to do. The really cool thing that we do at my gym is every 90 days, we do goal setting consultations with our clients. We don't force them, but we really push them to do it. They come sit down with the coach. They do an in-body. We do a scan. We ask them, what, what, are, what are you most proud of accomplishing in, in the, these last 90 days? What did you struggle with the most? And then what are your goals for the next 90 days? And what we see is patterns where people... We'll say the same thing for six to nine months. And I'm like, hey, listen, you know, pardon my French, but this is bullshit. This is either not a real goal of yours or you're refusing to take the advice that I'm giving you. So now it's time to take it to the next level and take this to some one on one coaching. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. I'm ready to sign up. Let's do it. <laughs> um, how can people get in touch with you? Tell them a little bit about, you know, where you're at. Yeah, so uh, the the gym, the the main location is in White Plains. Uh, on Instagram, we're at Westchester Fit. Um, my personal page on Facebook is Chris Guerrero, G-U-E-R-R-E-R-O. On Instagram, it's Chris, it's Coach underscore Chris underscore Guerrero. Um, website, westchesterfit.com. Um, that's where you'd find most of the information. Uh, you know, we, we have regular... Uh, blog post content on there for, from a multitude of different avenues, health and fitness related. Excellent. So what's next for you? Uh, well, as you know, over the past year, one of the passions I've had is uh, helping other small business owners. So I've been doing a lot of mentorship with, uh, with, with small gym owners in particular, uh, helping them build and establish their systems so they can get out of the day to day grind and be able to, to, develop and create other systems of wealth. Um, and, and, and this year, my focus is, is doing things that make me happy, not being so stressed out about the little things. So, yeah. Yeah. Don't let that straw break that camel's back, if you will. Well, yeah. it's been my pleasure. 
you know, I, we kept it to a concise amount of time. I wish I had more of you. Um, I hope to see you soon. Thanks for coming on. Rob Silverman, Chris Guerrero, Proven Health Alternatives.